Aloha! In this video, I'm going to talk about Polynesian pop, or commonly known as tiki, one of the most colorful pop phenomena of the mid-century America. I love tiki. Uh, I think it's one of my favorite aesthetics. Um, I think I discovered the Polynesian culture, or at least I kind of like uh, made me aware of it. Um, it's quite silly, but this, uh, when I was a child, I went to this amusement park that it's divided on areas based on real cultures. And one of those areas is based on the Polynesian culture. And actually the name of this area is Polynesia. And there was this show and you will see all these girls, you know, these Wahine girls dancing the hula dance. Like I fell in love immediately with this. And then I remember watching a movie with my mom. Uh, I think the name of it it's Hula Girl. I'm not I'm not sure, um, but it's a Japanese movie, and it talks about a group of girls who end up into in this hula dance competition. Beautiful movie. I really loved it. But yeah, these two things kind of like got me into this obsession with this Polynesian aesthetic, I guess. Well, that's why you kind of like see me wearing this sort of like uh, Polynesian outfit. Um, I don't know if I look very Polynesian. I feel like I'm looking more um, more Mexican than Polynesian, but well, I tried. <laughs> but anyway, where does this tiki term comes from? Well, it actually originates from a mythological figure from the Polynesian culture. Half man and half god, it's basically kind of like a Polynesian version of Adam. Since the story resembles a little bit. But the ticket from America, it's not about any anything about religion or anything about spirituality. It's just purely aesthetic. So I seen some articles that said this kind of like tiki obsession in America started in the 1930s with all this uh, opening of tiki theme bars and restaurants across the US that gained a huge popularity. But the interest actually started as soon as those islands were discovered uh, during the age of exploration by those uh, European ships coming back with idealized stories about those islands. Going back to the 1930s, those restaurants served food, drinks, music, decor, with a theme reminiscent of a traditional Polynesia. Fabulous and exotic cocktails such as the iconic Mai Tai still being made today. Many of those cocktails that we're drinking today were made during that era. Serve by cute woman with a sexy tiki attire. I gotta say there's some sexual connotations uh, within the phenomenon. The native Iceland girl became a sex symbol in the entertainment industry with their kind of like frontal nudity. <laughs> Uh, usually they will cover uh, a little bit of their chest with their hair, but they didn't wear anything in most cases. And keep in, keep in mind that uh, America was still very uptight. So as you can imagine, the whole thing was pretty scandalous. So there were a lot of stereotypes uh, because of wrong conclusions from those first European explorers that I just mentioned. Who mistook those uh, wholeness dances as very sexual as a signal that Hawaiian women were both promiscuous and sexually available to them. In terms of accuracy and authenticity, mm, well, <laughs> when I was doing my research, I seen photos of ads from those restaurants where they would mix Cantonese food and tropical spectacles, selling it as a very tropical experience overall. But the thing is, there's nothing tropical about Cantonese food. But I think the reason behind this is because back in the days in America, Chinese well, slash Cantonese food was pretty extended already, but still considered very exotic. And I don't think Americans will have enjoyed or appreciated the real Polynesian food. So they sell the whole Chinese food as very exotic to them. You know, it's very tropical um, to seem more relatable, I guess. But anyway, I don't think authenticity matter that much. It was basically a combination, a catch combination of Asian and Polynesian cultures. And later on, they had the zombies even. So yeah, it was kind of like a crazy mix of different things, I guess. And they sell the whole thing as tropical because it was, it was easier to monetize the whole thing. Anyway, Tiki really started to become a real movement after the second, the second World War. Soldiers came back from serving in the South Pacific with nostalgic tales of their tropical wonders. 
Also, an expedition was made in 1947 named Kontiki, later became into a best-selling book, Kontiki Across the Pacific and Around. Hollywood also made the 1949 Rogers and Hammerstein musical South Pacific, which was based in the novel Tales of the South Pacific by the Pulitzer Prize winner James Michener in 1948. The increasing affordable flights, particularly air travel to Hawaii, helped to instigate America's interest in all things tropical and Hawaii also became the fifth state of the U.S. in 1959. Within fashion, Tiki became a mainstream among the American clothing. The star of the mall was the sarong dress, very popular among women, and it was also associated with being a model using turns advertisement and actresses such as Dorothy Lamour. Known as both the Saron Girl and the Saron Queen from her role in 1937 film The Hurricane. There were other movies such as Song the Saron and Saron Girl released during the 1940s. Another popular movie was Blue Hawaii with Elvis Presley and his Hawaiian shirt. He was definitely one of the icons of this aesthetic movement. He also helped to make the Polynesian pop popular where within two subgenders emerged named Lounge and Exotica. There was a very popular singer called Ima Zumak, who quickly became famous because of her diverse vocal range and Exotica songs in the 1940s. music and aesthetics were uh, obvious reminiscent of these Tahitian cultures. She was not from Polynesia, she was actually Peruvian instead. This kind of like annoys me that most of the celebrities and icons from this uh, Tiki movement were not even from those cultures, like you know the celebrities that I just mentioned already, or for example Sir Williams in the film Pag and Love Song from the 1950s whose character was supposed to be half Tahitian. Mm, well, whatever. But I guess it's the Hollywood charm. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> but I don't have anything against her. I love me so Mr. Williams. I think she's an icon and she was a very talented swimmer. In any case, I would like to mention a much fitting personality, Tarita Teripaya, an actress of French Polynesia and Chinese descent, who got in the spotlight for sharing screen with Marlo Brando in the film Mutiny on the Bounty. <laughs> I love their chemistry. No wonder that later on they became a couple. They got married actually. But well, going back to fashion, a part of the already mentioned saron dress, you will see ladies wear a western pattern dress rocking some beautiful tropical designs on them. A special mention, the king of Tiki's fashion, Alfred Shaheen, the most important designer of Hawaii during the 1950s. He created clothing manufacturing and retail empire and made the tropical print a truly elegant statement. Those prints have their origins in the traditions of Shaheen's multicultural stuff. Hawaii was then home to many first generations immigrants from Asia and the South Pacific. He apparently will send his staff on trips to countries around the world which were then incorporated into the sprints. That's a reason of the mix of Japanese, Chinese, and even Indian elements featuring Shaheen prints. Fabric patterns with gardenias, hibiscus, and florals became really popular in America as they palm fronds and similar types of tropical plants or animals such as fish and birds. 
For men, the Hawaiian shirt already mentioned with Elvis Presley will become a symbol of leisure and extremely popular by American men. Even President Truman was pictured wearing a Hawaiian shirt on the cover of Life magazine. Called as well Aloha shirts on the island, by the way, Aloha means love. This shirt's history is more than Hawaiian and can be traced on a mix of cultural influences. The shirt was actually made with a western style silhouette and was originally inspired by sailor shirts. Cut from Japanese kabe crack fabric originally used for kimonos was sewn by Japanese and Chinese sailors who immigrated to Hawaii as plantation field workers and was ultimately worn like a Filipino of our own Tagalog. Tiki has avoided any serious comments about the exploitation, basically the appropriation of use of objects and symbols from other cultures. It certainly hasn't included any boys of the Pacific Islanders whose gods have been turned into cocktail mugs and ancient design models. And I think that's the point with Tiki honoring a culture with a too simplistic mindset while misusing their sacred traditions. But on the other hand, um, I also think about those um, soldiers who gave the service during the, st during the Second World War. Afterwards, they didn't want to talk about um, their experience in war. They would rather focus instead on those funny and exotic cocktails and those, you know, sexy dances instead. It was kind of like, let's focus instead on the good side of this and let's forget about the horrors we have seen in war. You know, that is the reason why I think Tiki never intended to be taken seriously or to portray the real thing, as I already mentioned. It was always kind of like a naive homage to a culture and never meant as a parody or to ridicule of. And they were, I think they were kind of like showing their appreciation for its culture, they were celebrating it, and they gave them an exposure that, you know, those islands didn't have before. But anyway, that's everything I have to say for now. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Maybe you learned something new you didn't know about Tiki. If you knew, please let me know in the comments below. And see you next time. Bye-bye.